So, hi everybody. Good morning. Thank you for joining the show again. And joining us today is John Jacolia. And thank you so much, John, for spending your time with us. Uh, it's our privilege here to connect with you virtually. And today we would like to hear a lot from you, your experience, your work, your passion, and your story will give us a lot of inspirations and motivations in life, especially a lot of changing nowadays, and we need to really refocus. <laughs> so join, would you please <laughs> share with us a bit about yourself and maybe bring sure. us back your journey, how all the great work started. Yeah. Yes, I uh, thank you. Thank you very much for having me exciting to be a part of your show. Um, well, I, uh, <clears throat> I grew up in Washington, D.C. I lived there uh, for 55 years, something like that, maybe 60 years, and then we moved here to Florida about 10 years ago. Um, I like the weather in Florida, but I miss everything else about Washington. I miss this, I miss the culture and the museums and all the other things that I kind of grew up taking for granted. <laughs> you know, we sort of take for granted wherever we are or whatever we do. I mean, I can remember being angry about having to drive around the Capitol uh, because <laughs> it's a giant, anytime you have to go to this side of town to that side of town, it's a giant traffic jam. It's like, uh, uh, I wish this wasn't here. And of course now it's not here and I miss it like crazy. So. <clears throat> I grew up in Washington, even as a little boy, I remember you know, doing things like roller skating in the basement of the Capitol, mm -hmm. um, which I got chased down by the police almost on a daily basis, but uh, metal, metal roller skates on marble floors is very, very fun. Um, so I grew up in Washington, the, my parents were very uh, dictatorial and, and authoritative. Uh, both emotionally and physically, so that it wasn't a warm and fuzzy development kind of thing. Um, the idea was, by the time I got <clears throat> into high school, or out of high school, heading for college, the idea was stay low and stay invisible, and you don't get in any trouble if nobody notices you, um, which is not a really good thing to learn as a kid if you want to go and be a speaker or a leader or anything else, because the idea before is, be very be below the radar. Don't be above the radar. Be below the radar. And so, what happened is I uh, I went through high school, which was uh, fun. You know, it was just like I did in other high school. I I did learn that I could sing, and uh, I was in choir and chorus, and I was in a rock and roll band for about five years as a singer, and uh, and that was an excellent an excellent uh, experience in getting out in front of people. The microphone, spotlight, a thousand people in the audience. It was exciting, very exciting. Um, and it taught me that I could do these things uh, and o began to overwhelm the tapes that said I can't. Mm -hmm. You know, that I began to learn that I can. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is sort of show up and practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, you know, practice until you get it. That's kind of the idea behind the willingness in the, in the book is you have to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations or you're never going to grow. Yep. College was um, really pretty, well I was in a fraternity in college and, uh, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, <clears throat> it was a, it was a, uh, this was in the late 60s so it was, there was a lot of turmoil, it was, uh, you know, protests, and the uh, Vietnam War was going on and so there was a lot of turmoil in college. So mm -hmm. it was interesting, again, to learn that I could take a position, talk about it, and, uh, and and bring people to my thinking, which was, you know, we should probably try and find a way to live peacefully rather than to constantly in conflict, mm -hmm. which unfortunately I don't think we've ever learned. We, <laughs> when we continue to stay in some level of conflict, which drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we need the women in charge. That's, that's what I think. We need, you know, less men, more women, quieter, and calmer lives. That's, I truly believe that. I think men have had their chance. They had two or three thousand years. They haven't done a very good job. Let's give the women a chance to do this. Mm -hmm. um, so college and then graduate school at the University of Chicago, uh, which was in business and, and marketing. Um, but the, pro 
the problem with being my age is there's nothing less valuable than a graduate degree that's 45 years old. <laughs> you know, I mean, the things I learned have no relevance uh, to the things that are going on today with the, the fine exception of life still based on relationships, mm. you know, and <clears throat> whether people can trust you or they, or they, or you can't get, or you're not trustworthy, one or the other. Um, so that's the one thing that I sort of honed in on when I, when I, started in business, the idea was, how can I develop a business where the people feel as if I have their best interests at heart? Because mm. I had worked for my father for a couple of years, um, which was not a very good, not a very good working relationship. But, you know, he taught me how not to, not to be a leader. I mean, he hired minimum wage people, he worked them and worked them and worked them, and then when they wanted a raise, he'd fire them and hire some more minimum wage people. And I kept thinking, this is so ridiculous. We're wasting so much time on training and trying to get people acclimated. Uh, why don't we just hire people and, and bring them forward in their careers? Mm -hmm. um, so when I started my company uh, in, uh, in the late 70s, um, it, the, it was the idea. The idea was, how can I develop a company that's not focused on me? And that's where sort of changing the focus came from. The idea was, you know, yes, I want to make a good living. But I don't need to make a killing. I just need to make a living. And so, you know, how can I help the people who work for me grow and and develop into the kind of people they want? And sometimes that doesn't have anything to do with my industry. Mm -hmm. I can remember sending people to to a, a community college or local colleges for for out uh, homeschool type of programs where they study at home, go back to university every couple of weeks. On, on all sorts of things, from uh, mechanical work to uh, languages that they wanted to learn. I mean, it's nice to send them to learn about sales and marketing and warehousing and all those kinds of things, yeah. but it's also nice to find out what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. And then when you send them to school, they realize this company really cares about me. They, this company really cares about my future. And all of a sudden, you find yourself being the place people want to come to work, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I looked for more salespeople, people knew that we paid the best, that we paid frequently, that we were very appreciative and supportive of our people. So whether it was a, a janitor or a truck driver or a salesperson or a management person, when we advertised that we were looking for a person in those, we had the very cream of the crop showing up begging for a job because mm -hmm. they wanted to work with us. And that, to me, is what a, a company really should be, is sought after. If you're, if you're in an industry, you should be sought after by the people who are the best in that industry. Mm. Um, if, you know, if <clears throat> you have people who work for you and they're good, they will always have opportunities to work other places. Yes. Always. Because there'll be people calling them and checking and seeing if they can hire them away from you. And, the thing is, is that good people have choices. So if you have bad leadership, those good people will leave. Mm. And all you'll be left with are people who have no choices mm. because nobody else wants to hire them. So pretty soon, you'll have a whole company full of people who have no choice to, but to stay, mm. which means mediocre or worse. Mm. So you know, we have to make sure that we are constantly attentive to the needs of others. And this kind of leads through where we were. I mean, when I sort of came to this realization from a personal standpoint, which is what cost me, caused me to write the book, uh, I was building a business in, focused on the needs of others, but I wasn't focused on the needs of my family. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was focused on my needs and my employees' needs. And my personal life was sort of back here, and eventually I'll get to it. You know, I'll get to paying attention to my wife and my children back here. Mm. Um, the problem is, is that if you're running a business, you never get back here. There's mm. always something in front of you that keeps you focused and having to move forward. Mm. So the only way that you can grow is to take this life that you put back here and bring it in and, and include it in the rest of your life. Because mm. otherwise, you'll miss things. Mm. I mean, I can remember missing... Um, back to school nights. And I, I have a 50 year old daughter. I know I look much younger than that. But I have a I have a 50 
year-old daughter who still talks about me missing her fourth grade back to school night. Whoa. She would have been 10 years old. That's 40 years later. She still remembers that. But she's not angry about it anymore, but she still remembers it. But I couldn't tell you why I missed it. There's mm -hmm. nothing, I, I have no memory of what was so important that I had to miss that. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in business, you have this false sense of, I don't know if it's ego or whatever is driving it. Entrepreneurs tend to be driven because they want to work for themselves. They don't really want to be a part of, a, of an organization. And so it's, it's very hard to come up with a balance between that ego-driven and heart-driven. So being driven by either uh, ego or love, I mean, that's sort of it for me. It's a, and the ego tends to be fearful because you're always trying to scramble to get to the next thing. Mm. You're never appreciative of the present moment, always in the future. Um, and so you can find yourself in a lot of personal trouble mm. uh, if all you're focused on. So I ended up divorced. My kids, after 10 back-to-school nights that I missed, my kids didn't like me very much. They didn't want to be around me very much. And uh, I had this giant uh, economic explosion in the U.S. from the early 90s, which was very much like 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, and the bank came in and called all my loans because I had, I had the ability to pay the loans back. <laughs> mm -hmm. They had a whole lot of people who, they had loans, but they had no, they had no assets. So they mm. couldn't pay the bank, mm. but I had assets. So they took all my assets and paid themselves back. So after 12 years of building up a company, um, it went away in about 90 days. Mm. And um, it was uh, 400 employees. We were doing, I don't know, $60 million a year worth of sales in three states. Um, it was a great business. People loved it. I still, for about two or three years, I kept getting notes from people about, are you going to open another business? Are you going to open up? Because I really want to come to work with you. And, <laughs> uh, excuse me, I opened a, a service business after that um, because it was, you know, I didn't have any, I really didn't have any cash. I didn't have any credit. Uh, the way the bank came in and took over the company, I couldn't go back to the same industry again because mm. the people who I had purchased things from the bank never paid them. They just kept all the, kept all the money. Mm. Now, the bank didn't pay for the vendors. The bank didn't pay the clients back for deposit money. They had given deposit. I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars of deposit money that the bank just kept. Uh, they didn't pay the sales tax for the for the previous month. The banks they bounced all these checks. So I, I found myself, you know, sort of in debt and uh, sort of lost as to where to go next. Uh, and so I just determined if I was going to move forward, I had to make a plan. So I made a plan to pay these, even though it wasn't really my responsibility, I wanted to make sure that the people who had lost money got paid back. Mm -hmm. So we set up a structure for paying them back. Um, I opened up a new company, which was a similar business, but not the same. So I didn't have to, I could use the same customers, but it was a different product. Mm -hmm. So I was able to go back to the same customers. So I was able to build up a new company very quickly. So um, I built up, this was a service business versus sales and distribution, warehousing and trucking, that kind of thing. This was service where I was working you know, as a broker for printing and marketing supplies. In those mm -hmm. days, it was also websites were just starting to come along. Uh, so we got into both electronic marketing and print marketing. Um, and so I, I only needed, it was a distribution business, I needed 400 employees. With this business, we're doing the same amount of profit, I had five employees. Aww. So it was, I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a much easier business. It wasn't anywhere near as stressful. And I kept thinking, why, why would I have done this for 12 years, all this stress and angst and problems, um, when I could have thought about, smart enough to have thought of something else. And the problem I realized was there was a disconnect between uh, my knowledge and my emotion. I mm. knew what I needed to do, but I didn't have the heart to be able to do it mm. in many cases. I didn't have the heart to rebuild the relationship with my kids. Mm. I didn't have the heart to <clears throat> show up when my wife asked me if I could please come home for an anniversary dinner. I didn't, I didn't come home because I was trying to be important. Um, I do say that I'm a recovering big shot. Mm. So 
I am uh, trying not to be a big shot anymore. <laughs> it was too much, too much ego driven. So uh, <clears throat> the new company. Hey, this daily sick got developed along the way. It was, a, it was how I sort of came out of that depression state when the bank took over the business. How do you sort of get back on your feet? How do you create a plan for living on a daily basis that works? And the Daily Six just kind of evolved out of that. You know, be willing to try new things, focus on the needs of others, you know, be loving and forgiving, make sure you pray or meditate or whatever it is you want to do, but be grateful, forgiving, and make sure you move it from here <laughs> into action. You know, don't just think about being a nice person. Be a nice person. Mm. Um, so it's uh, so that's kind of the Daily Six. It, 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 near the end of the 90s, I started getting asked to come and do speeches, mm. keynote speeches in groups. I was still running a company, so I was like, oh, okay, fine. So I would go talk and come back, and that led to more people wanting me to come and speak. Uh, so in 19, uh, 2001, 2001, I sold the company <laughs> and started the process of writing the Daily Six. I had a lot of CEOs who were friends in D.C. who I knew who all said, you know, whatever you're doing, we want to learn how to do that because you look like you're calm, you look like you're centered and balanced. So teach, teach me how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I started coaching a lot of business owners. Um, that led to more speaking engagements, which led to training companies about how to change this culture from focusing on me to focusing on us. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the issue about knowledge and emotion. To me, I've never worked with anybody who wasn't really, really smart. But I have worked with people who haven't been able to be emotionally engaged. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a very uncomfortable... Nobody teaches you that in business school. They do not mm -hmm. teach you how to be socially connected to your employees in business school. Mm -hmm. they, just, they just don't. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of you're learning blacks and whites. And life and business is all gray, mm -hmm. so you have to really learn how to do those things instead of instead of just staying by the book. The mm -hmm. book has to change as business changes, as life changes, as your employees' lives change, and we have to be as engaged as we can be in the lives of the people who work with us, mm -hmm. whether it be a coworker or. A and what their needs are and their issues are. So we can be responsive to those needs, and mm -hmm. when we are responsive to the needs of others, we are we become powerful leaders, whether it be personal or professional. Mm -hmm. When I'm when, when when I am not proud of things, that's not the wrong. It's good to be proud of something, but what I do with people when I'm in a workshop is I ask them to write down the five things you're most proud of, and they write family and business, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, now go back and scratch out the word proud. And write the word grateful. And so I am grateful for my wife. Instead of I am proud for my wife. I'm grateful for my children. I'm grateful for my work. I'm grateful to be. You know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that I'm very fit. Well, you should be grateful that you're very fit. Mm -hmm. So it, it just changes the way the dynamic is. You're thinking about it. So when you can mix emotion with with the knowledge that you already have, again, I've never worked with anybody that wasn't pretty well educated because I, I usually work with, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Everybody, everybody I think knows the difference between what's right and what's wrong. Mm. You know, you look at some of these things and you see corporate greed or you see people doing things that you realize are completely unethical. I guarantee you, these people know that the, what they're doing is unethical. This is not a surprise. Yeah. Uh, you know, totally agree. They know what they're doing. They're making that conscious decision. So they're not that they're ignorant. It's that they choose to do things that are driven by fear rather than driven by love. And uh, a friend of mine and I were talking a couple weeks ago, and, and she said, "What do you? What, what's the first thing you think of uh, when you talk about the way you live now? And I said, to me, it's just love surrounds us. Mm. So it either... <clears throat> It's not that it doesn't surround us, it's that sometimes we don't notice it. Mm -hmm. You know, love is like a river flowing down 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 the path, and it's always there. It's always flowing down the path. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're close to it, we're in it, and we stay close to it, and we feel wonderful, and then other times we 
wander away from it. And we wonder why we're angry and stressful and fearful and all these other things. The, the river of the love is still here. I have, I have wandered away from it. It has not wandered away from me. I just need to come back and be immersed in it again. Mm. And usually that just comes from awareness, practicing prayer, meditation, mindfulness issues. Uh, you can do that whether you're religious or spiritual or agnostic or whatever. Mm. The idea is trying to center yourself uh, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually allows you to <clears throat> walk forward with a sense of confidence and a sense of uh, belief that your job is to help others be more successful. Mm. And in that task, we become more successful ourselves. Mm. I, I hope I'm not overwhelming. <laughs> I'm not trying to create <laughs> drinking from a fire hose here. So if, if there are specific questions, I'm happy to answer them. But that's really kind of in a nutshell. I, I started this business, wrote the book, started doing a lot of consulting work with companies that, that wrote the book. I had two or three companies that are here in Florida when I moved here that bought the book and gave it to all their employees. Every time they had a new employee, they gave the Daily Six. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend who was running a program here called the Wounded Warriors Project, which had to do with wounded Vietnam veterans, Vietnam veterans, Iraq, Iran veterans who had been wounded. And he was using the book to help work with them, work with the wounded soldiers mm -hmm. with some of their PTSD issues. Mm -hmm. Because it's it helps them sort of stabilize and realize just like me when I was a kid and I thought well, stay invisible, mm. you know. And that also, if you're depressed, you want to stay invisible. If you're if you're wounded or you're missing a leg or an arm, you're feeling sad and depressed. Mm. And the idea here is if you can be driven by love, gratitude, and service to others, I become much less important. The focus on me becomes much less important mm. than the focus on that. On the others mm -hmm. and as I focus here my spirit becomes brighter and lighter and I can just continue to move forward Wow John thank you so much for sharing your your life from the beginning for you were small up until all the uh, challenging moment in your life and then rebuild everything from scratch and you know start yeah. with everything uh, from there up until what you are doing now. We, we're really thankful for sharing those uh, emotional moments in your life. Uh, I want to bring you back to when you were uh, a little boy, John, and make sure this time don't worry about the police in Asia I mean, there's no relations. <laughs> but John, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, related to um, you know when, when the culture back then when your mom your your and your father told you to stay out of the right uh, and you know stay and uh, you know and and get out and stay out of troubles uh, back then what did John think one day when you grow up you're gonna be become can you share with us um, <clears throat> I think when I was young I sort of had this idea of being a doctor a doctor uh -huh. and in those days those days doctors did house calls so they would come to the house and, and check you over mm. and they seemed very professional you know they had a bag they had a bag and they opened the bag and reached in the bag and found ways to make people better mm. and so i think that for me um, that sort of became a connection early on you know mm. how can i i lived in a very uncomfortable very sort of driven by manipulation kind of a family and uh, finding somebody who's out there whose job it is to make people healthier or bring a sense of wellness mm. was a very powerful uh, direction in my life. Mm. It was just like I got to high school and you had to learn Latin to be a doctor mm. and I was never good at languages so I, so I think Latin, otherwise I'd been a doctor. <laughs> Latin high school messed me up. All um, because of Latins, right? <laughs> all because of Latins. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, so, if you speak well, well Latin, then the world already have a wonderful <laughs> doctor, John <laughs> Chaplier, right? You know, I, I still don't understand why it was so critically important to be a, be a Latin scholar, but I guess that's maybe that's changed in 40 years or so. Mm. But it was really important in those days. You had to have it when you got out of college, you could go to medical school. It had, mm. you had to have three years of Latin. You had to have a GPA that was quite high. Mm. So I had the GPA, I just couldn't get past the Latin. <laughs> John, um, 
th there's a old, there's a story that uh, I've been told a long, long, long time ago. But it keep on my head is that if an elephant being chained when they were a kid, right? And you know he or she were a kid, and then you know you circle in an elephant within that circle of uh, that. He or she been chained on, then uh, even you know when they grow up uh, and then you remove the chain and but the elephant will not go out of that circle, and now it leads to your uh, your life story because you uh, you know I think emotionally and mentally you've been chained on the ideas of stay low in the you know and stay and stay within the radar get out don't get out of trouble and don't be visible if you know if you make right. visible it's gonna right. cause you problem. And then, right. and then, but from there, and I look backward into, I look forward into your high school year. You start, you know, uh, singing uh, in front of a thousand people. I uh, take three people to tango and things like today. <laughs> uh, or start, you know, you never work for anyone. Start your business from, uh, you know, from the beginning. And those things that make you spotlight. Right. Yes. Exactly. And yes. That's what I said at the beginning. Uh -huh. All the things that had to happen back in here, bad, you know, Difficult as a kid, trying to come out of the shell, learning how to stand on my own, that brought me to where I am. The, the, the question that we had was, uh, we are having is, where did you find the courage and, and, uh, uh, and the, the moment of realization, the power that give you, uh, you know, the, the strength that say, John, uh, enough is enough, I want to get out, I want to try, I, wanna, I don't want to be, in, uh, be invisible yeah. anymore, anymore. Can you share with us? Uh, because a lot of our audience might have been or might have friends or have, might have known somebody in their life that being chained, uh, you know, like that. Yeah. And they want to have their friends to get out of, of, of that, uh, you know, blockage. Well, Especially I, for yeah, our I, culture. For our culture also. <laughs> it's well, it's a, it's, a, it's a very personal story. I don't think I've ever told anybody this. But my father was very physical in, in his punishment. So... Um. Um, a lot of kids get whipped by their parents with belts and all sorts of things. So my father was a, you know, hit first and ask questions later kind of guy. And so um, I would get a beating, whipping, whatever you want to call it, every Monday night when he got home from work. Every Monday night. Because he was sure that there were things that I did that he didn't catch. So... I got to look forward to that every Monday night. And I can remember, you know, when I was little, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, uh, this was a horribly fearful night for me because no matter what I had done, no matter how good I had behaved, no matter what, this was going to happen when my father arrived home. And when I was 12 years old, I remember, and I think this was sort of the beginning of the crack in the shell, when he got home on Monday night, I simply stood there and looked straight at him and took the whipping or beating or whatever without any words, without sadness, without any tears, just staring straight at him. And I never got another beating as long as I lived after that. So I think it was having the, I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it came from. But it came from somewhere in here is that that's enough. I, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm -hmm. And so this is what happens with people these are things I call gifts of devastation. A gift of devastation is something that is devastating to you, like losing my company or getting beaten every Monday night um, or getting a divorce or having a heart attack. These are all horrible experiences that we have that when we get further away from them, we realize there's a gift associated with it. Mm. Would I love to have the whippings that my father gave me over again? No, I don't. But am I grateful for the fact that it taught me to stand up for myself mm -hmm. and and stand up to an oppressive leader? Yes, it did. Uh, did losing my business teach me? Uh, was it was an exciting time? Was it an exciting time? No, it was not an exciting time. But it taught me that I could rebuild my life, mm -hmm. and as I rebuilt my life, I could create new principles. I didn't have to just re and just follow up the same way I'd been living. I could do something different with it. Mm. And that's where the Daily Six came from. Mm. I knew that if I had to rebuild my life, I should do it on a different set of principles. Not money, greed, power, but service, love, forgiveness. Mm. And, you know, I made a living, a very good living, both ways. You know, mm. money, power, greed, 
love, forgiveness, gratitude, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But love, forgiveness, gratitude, service was much less stressful, mm -hmm. got me much better results, mm -hmm. had much happier culture within our organization, mm -hmm. and rebuilt a relationship with my ex-wife, rebuilt a relationship with my kids. Uh, I was I, got, I had gotten remarried, we had a son. It, it gave me the the strength to learn how to really be a good father. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, the things that are good for us and the things that are unhealthy for us, and if we just learn that these are not necessarily good or bad or right or wrong, but let's just wait and see. Mm -hmm. So don't make a decision today on what's happening. Mm -hmm. you, when you get further away from it, I, almost everybody I've ever had has called me mm -hmm. <clears throat> and said, I just got fired. Then they call, and it's terrible. My life is over. My life is over. And they call me 90 days later and said, "Well, I had to move home because I lost all my money. And when I was home, I met this woman that I fell in love with, and now we're going to get married." Mm. Now, if you hadn't lost the job, you would not have moved home. You would have not have met the person. Yep. I've had the same story with people who've lost lost jobs. They moved somewhere else, and they found a much better job at a much better place. Mm. So, it's instead of trying to push force our will into our lives every day, sometimes it's much easier to just be peaceful mm. and realize that life is going to happen around you, mm. and I can either engage it and create more chaos, or I can simply step back and be an observer mm. and step in when I want to and step back when I don't, sort of mm. like stepping back from my father. Mm. And so uh, we do not have to engage in the, in the, in the difficulties of life or the world we can simply be a part of it without being a contributor to it. We don't have to contribute to the negativity. We can be observers, and if we're calm and centered and balanced, mm. we can influence people in a positive way mm. rather than attempting to control them. Our influence is very important, and but our influence is only good when we are emotionally in balance mm. ourselves. Yes, John. You know, once we lose this, once we lose this, everything else goes away. John, life has given you a lot of harsh and it's also given you a lot of greatness. I think it's a rich experience from whatever you've been through that 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 build the John who you are today, the wisdom that you can you can have and you can transfer to the people around you. But one thing that uh, and then one thing that Vivian and I are always trying to uh, to ask our our speakers and the people around us is ability to think. All right, and uh, you know, from time to time, to, there's a lot of different moments and times in your life, and you you force yourself to think, and then you want you force yourself to think the John's way of thinking, so that you know can help you or hurt you. It doesn't matter, but you know, at least you think first, and then you start to come up with action to change uh, towards something else. And then um, we've been seeing uh, our ability for human beings, for the friends around people we know, it's not only increasing, but actually in the declining mode. And then, and then and our mission is to help the people to improve that thing, yeah, pick it up and think and, 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 and increase their ability to think again. So what is the secret sauce that, that, that John had back then, is having now? to think differently? Well, I think for me, it was the realization that I can't fix this with this. Mm. Oh. You know, this is, what, this is where, this is why I feel the way I feel. This is why I think the way I think. This, mm. It's all been driven into here. So my problems really are from here to here. Mm. This is all I've got about seven inches of problems. Mm. And if I, if I take the time to, and this is why willingness is number one in the Daily Six. We have mm. to be willing to find new teachers mm. to teach us new lessons, mm. whether it be, <clears throat> whether it be, uh, like I said, spiritual or practical. I mean, I've read as many practical books. I've got a whole library full of books back here. Mm. Um, it's you have to be willing to open up your mind, and this is this is because opening your mind opens your heart, mm. and and as we stop trying to be controlling and start trying to be influencing, mm. we stop demanding and start asking. This is one of the things that I've worked with people on. You know, how do I work with these crazy millennials? And it's like, it, what are you doing with them? And I'm telling them how to behave, and I'm telling them what to do, and I'm telling them this and that. I'm like, <laughs> why don't you ask them instead of tell them? 
Why don't you ask them, well, how do you think this should work? Because that's, they, nobody taught them to ask questions. You're just supposed to demand that somebody behave in a certain way. So what helped me learn to think was uh, just learning that I am not the smartest guy in the room, necessarily. There are things I can learn from anyone. But as soon as I think that I'm the only person with any intelligence, then I'm demanding and controlling. And if I can change the way I think, and the only way I changed the way I thought was to find new teachers, whether I, whether it was, I found two or three human teachers, one was a minister, one was a consultant, and one was a night watchman. <laughs> so, you know, it's, you can learn things from everyone, you just have to be open enough. Mm -hmm. it's, like I talk about a lot of times, finding the time in the day to go for a walk, and finding the beauty in the walk, whether it's mm -hmm. downtown New York, or in the country in Iowa, or mm -hmm. Idaho. It's, it, no matter where you are, if you look and focus, you get your focus turned from this to this, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you notice the beauty, you mm -hmm. notice the, the, the goodness that is around us, but if we stay just tight and wrapped, that business and focus, and I, I need to get ahead, if that's your focus, then normally those people tend to burn out because they have too much stress. Um, it's very help. It's very important to find ways to build in self care because changing your thinking requires you to take care of yourself. Mm. Uh, I know so many people who pretend to be caring and loving and supportive, but they're still stressed out because they're pretending. Mm. <laughs> they don't really. They're not really relaxed. They're not really. They're just sort of behaving the way that they think other people want them to behave. Mm. And carrying that burden around all the time is very stressful. This is the issue I have with physicians. I talk to physicians all the time, especially with COVID, about burnout, because they just refuse to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned early on was, if I don't take care of myself, I cannot take care of you. I mean, like, if I don't take care of myself, I can't help you. I mm -hmm. have to help me. It's like in a plane. They say to put on your mask and then help your children. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's, not, it's the same way in life. Mm -hmm. Help yourself, then you can help others. But mm -hmm. if you don't take care of this, there's nothing, everything else is just useless. And John, so, isn't it something that, uh, that funny? Because uh, I, I've been seeing the trend like that, uh, you know, like uh, long ago, if we talk about self-care, then it's become selfish. <laughs> Right, and right. People, you know, right, and right. then and then, but now there's a lot more talks about you know you need to you know really take well care of yourself, and it's not selfish anymore. It, it is that that right. you you do care for your own inner first, so that you can care right. for the outer. And I, I was the one that go against that philosophy until my recent talk to my father about two months ago. Vivian and I had a chance to you know have a deep talk with my father and he told us that you know, 30 years ago um, you know when when in the environment of lack because uh, you know the country back then was not open for you know like international trade that's you know very uh, you know local um, government so uh, you know and, and and you have to if you really really want to care for other people around you you have to make sure that you are wealthy you are good you are in good in, in, Great shape, great condition, so that you can, you know, care for the people around you. So uh, I'm, 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 I hope that this trend will continue because I believe this is the right way to do. Uh, if we cannot give, we don't get, right? So absolutely. Right. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, we can't, we can't give if we don't have. Yeah. And so you know, the idea here is not, not to focus on self to the point it becomes selfish. Mm. You know, it's it's I'm not it's it's like you know eating ice cream. It mm. tastes good if you just take a little bit. <laughs> if you eat the if you eat the whole container, you're gonna feel a little bit over you overindulge. And you can also do that with your health and everything else. If all I do is sit in the corner and meditate all day, what have I done for the world around me? Mm. So you know, it has to be a balance. It has to be the understanding of I'm I'm smart, but I'm also connected emotionally. I'm helping myself, but I'm also helping others. Mm. Um, that's why, <clears throat> excuse me, service is such a big component of the Daily Six. Mm. You have to stop worrying about what am I going to get out of this.
this mm -hmm. and start worrying about what am I putting into this? Mm -hmm. You know, what am I giving, not what am I getting? Mm -hmm. And when we, that's like pride and gratitude, you know, changing, being mm -hmm. proud of something and being grateful for it. Um, I, I've asked people who are in big arguments, conflicts between the departments and divisions. And I simply say, well, how can you see this in a different way? Mm. Rather, Because all they do is repeat this. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I'll just say the same thing over and over again until you finally say yes. Uh. You know, and <laughs> John, I have a question for that, and that is a personal question. And uh, that sure. relates to uh, my, me, my families, and the people that, uh, that we care about. Uh, and because uh, we have the knowledge that we know that we need to shift the focus to the right energy, to the right things, so that it will lead us lead into the right kind of action, the right kind of thinking, and the right kind of outcomes that kind of come after that, right? right. But then the emotion somehow snap us onto, you know, like, yeah, uh, I'm too angry, I'm too stressed, I'm right. too anxi you know, anxiety, right. and things, and, I, and then it, it contained me into the stage that I cannot shift my focus to where it should be and my knowledge tells me that I need to change it. So, uh, you, you're the expert in the Daily Six, you are the author and the creator of Daily Six and then the founder of Changing the Focus company and you have organization around the, you know, the world, you have individual around the world to change uh, you know, that focus. Can you teach us how we can, you know, if we get into the situation that you know, I'm thinking being controlled by emotions. What is the quick, quickest way for, for Vivian, for me, for my kids, for my, the people that we love to get out of that and free AI ourselves? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. Um, and long. The, an the answer is there isn't, there isn't any way. I mean, mm. that's the answer. It's like the, you know, they say once. <clears throat> You're me, right. I'm sorry, I'm wrong in my throat today, but. When's the best time to plant a tree? You've heard that. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Mm. You know, then you have a nice tree. And it's we have we have these tapes that go on in our head. I'm not good enough. Uh, she's she's always against me. He doesn't believe in me. He, she doesn't trust me. I don't. I'm not good enough to do this. We have all this stuff going on in our heads all the time. Mm. And what what? new teachers can do. I mean, I just went for a walk this morning with my dog and I have <coughs> a, uh, I have three different apps on my phone that have different levels of meditation, mm. mindfulness, uh, and changing and changing the way in which I'm thinking. Because mm. if left to my own devices, if it's just me sitting in a room talking about, all I'll be talking about is me. Mm. So, you know, I, I need to be around other people and I also need to give myself a break. I need to stop expecting my my brain to change its thinking, change its patterns right away. Mm -hmm. You'll have you'll have breakthroughs like me standing up for my father, or uh, realizing that I could start another business. The first one wasn't lucky. The second one was very successful too. So mm -hmm. it's you know you begin to learn. Oh, I really am pretty good at this. I really am smart enough to do these things. But what happens is, if you sort of think of it as pieces of paper, the, the, or here's a better analogy, I've written about this one. This is, if you think of yourself as a, a spiritual being with a bright light, bright centered light, what happens as we grow is people take blankets and put it over the light. Mm -hmm. Anger, the depression, you know, Anything that's ne any kind of negative behavior that you're picking up from other people, you're allowing them to take it and put it right over top of your light. Mm. Now, the light is still there. It's still bright, it's shiny. And so what happens as we practice meditation, we're cleaning out, we're sort of cleaning out the baggage of the past, the, the blankets come off. We take the blankets off. Mm. We listen to tapes. The problem is that <clears throat> as soon as we fall into old behavior, <clears throat> the blankets get right put, put, put right back on again. Mm. I'm not worthy. I'm not this. And then we have to keep practicing, taking them off, mm. taking them off, taking them off. Mm. And so uh, I think that our our ability to 
really change under any kind of circumstance is a byproduct of practice and time. Mm -hmm. I can't I can't make myself feel worthy tomorrow um, unless I begin to think of myself as worthy. Mm -hmm. And somewhere down the line, I will feel worthy, mm -hmm. uh, or I will feel like. I'm worthy of being loved. I'm worthy of being employed. I'm worthy of being cared about. Um, I'm worthy of these things because I, I do these things for others. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why service is so important because service allows us to help others. And in helping others, we begin to feel better about ourselves. Yeah, I'm a pretty good guy. I, you know, I did this or I volunteered here. I donated that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we begin to, instead of thinking about being a better person, we're actually acting and we're doing things that that connect our actions connect to our brains which tell us yes you you're moving on the right path yes this is the right way and I really do think so many people have never really felt the joy that it comes from feeling as if you're worthy and feeling as if you're helping others mm. and if you can connect those two, mm. feeling worthy and helping others, your life becomes much calmer. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, you don't have to get engaged in a lot of negativity. And so, for me, that's. I wish I could say, oh, here, read this, and tomorrow you'll be, you'll be, you know, the new Buddha. So it's just, it doesn't work. It's, mm -hmm. I wish. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I still yell at people when I'm driving in the car. <laughs> Come on, get out of the way. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my son, my son will tell you right now. He said, you think you're like Gandhi or something? I said, No, I wrote the book to tell people I'm not that, but I'm trying to work towards that. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that's what life is. Life mm -hmm. is a byproduct of working towards a goal that you've picked for yourself. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get to it? I think it's more practice than it is perfection. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just practicing on a daily basis. That's why it's a daily six. It's, mm -hmm. You know, every day I want to start the day thinking about others, being grateful for my life, mm -hmm. being loving, being forgiving. Mm -hmm. I get tired of carrying my old judgments forward. Mm -hmm. If you can't let go of the past, the present will always be weighted down with negativity. Mm -hmm. So learning to forgive, learning to let these things go, um, is I think is critical. And if you can do those things, you will eventually begin to feel lighter. You'll feel more like you're creating a better world around you, mm -hmm. even if it's just this small little area around you, you know, mm -hmm. your children, your wife, your yes. family, your father, you know, what can you do today to make your father smile? What can you do today to make your father smile? Mm -hmm. You think about that, mm -hmm. go do it, you know, and when you make him smile, I guarantee you, you will be smiling too. Yep. So it's, that's, you know, and in 20 years, maybe you'll be calm and kind. <laughs> mm. <laughs> John, uh, we really admire the story of your life. And uh, you've been in a very challenging time. Then you have everything. You lost many things and you revive everything. And uh, the, the, the daily six is the wisdom that you, uh, you know, you, you collect it through your life and then you put it onto a practice so that uh, so that I hope that a lot of people can read it, can practice it, can take it to action so that they can chase the right kind of light. Because uh, we all, you know, as a lot of us been chasing the different uh, kind of lies. And at the end of the day, sure. the wrong lies lead, to a, lead us to a life of emptiness and the right lie will right. You know, lead us to a, a life of fulfillment. So uh, I thank you for, for, for doing all the amazing work and thank keep you. doing thank that for much. a lot of people in our community, all right? Um, so we understand your past, you, we understand what you're doing now, and we're always curious to know more about what is the ahead that John is about to do that you want to share with us and the audience of the program? Well, what I'm, what I'm doing right now is I'm working with uh, two friends who are also uh, organizational consultants, mm. and we're, we're trying to sort of change the way in which I approach the Daily Six so that it's it goes back to what it originally was, which was a personal development plan. Because mm -hmm. I wrote it originally for me to change the way I was feeling and the way I was thinking when I was very depressed, and very angry, and very filled with fear. Mm -hmm. And it sort of became more of an organizational 
thing. Mm. And that's wonderful. I'm happy to do that, speak at conventions, that kind of thing. But I really want it to be something that changes individuals. I, I have a video out there somewhere that says, you know, we can change the world. Mm. You know, you and I can change the world. Mm. But it has to start somewhere. Yeah. And it has to start with me. Mm -hmm. I can't run out in the street and yell to 10 people, you know, that they should change. You know, you need to change. You need to change. Eureka. You know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, you, not me. You need to change. So it's, it, that's the thing. I mean, it, for, for me, it used to be if you were very successful, you were you had money. And if you were just a nice person, you were poor, mm. you know, because they don't go together. And my my feeling is, yes, you can be very significant in the lives of your family. You have to uh, impact the other. You can make a good living and be very happy and balanced, but you have to practice. Mm -hmm. You have to practice. So what I'm trying to do now is make sort of return to how this helps individuals. Because uh, my belief always was if you help the individuals, whether it strengthens a family or a team or an organization, it has to be done by the individual people. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're working on right now is, is trying to get the word out that that life changes <laughs> one person at a time. Sorry, I thought it was turned off. Uh, life will change one person at a time and I have to be person number one. Yes. You know, I have to be patient zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I really want to work on this year is even if it's just doing kind of what you're doing, which is to talk to people and talk about what is what good things have you done and felt and passed on. I mean, we are sort of, we should be a conduit, something that allows us to pass on success through us and to others. Mm. You know, we don't grab it and hold it. Grabbing it and holding it is, again, creates anger and resentment and fear because we don't want to lose anything. And, and so everything is, everything changes. Mm -hmm. So we take, we accept the good and the bad, we accept the right and the wrong, and we, if the more that we react to it, the more that it holds us back. Mm -hmm. So we've got to pull the blankets off. That's what I want to do this year. Is I want wow. to find a, a program on, online or in person now that I can travel again, mm -hmm. online or in person, that helps people realize that that light is there, mm -hmm. shining bright. Yep. And you have, we have let other people block out that light, mm. and we need to change that. Wonderful. And so that's where what I'm hoping to work on this year. Wonderful. If there anything that Vivian and I can be able to assist uh, to make that program, uh, you know, known and visible in this region, let us know. All right. So we we more than okay. happy to, to share that. And uh, and. Um, well, thank you very much for, for joining and sharing your story with us, John. Um, tell Susan that uh, that we we really admire uh, you know you, John, and tell Susan that you know it's okay. You have a lot of energy, so having hitch is another another source of energy that get your you know your ways uh, less and more stronger, right? So, yeah. so, I mean, um, it really is. It's, it's, it all starts in here. It mm. works out. And then, and then, uh, my audience say that they they want you to continue sharing videos because the videos that you've been recording is very, very good quality and uh, and very rich in content. So, uh, and then it, it, it's not too lengthy. It's it's it's, it's short so that people can take had a lot of takeaways from from the from the video. So, please keep doing that. We've been missing it. So, <laughs> uh, well, I, I I do admit I have not been very good at doing videos, but. One of the women who work, is working with me, is, that's exactly what she said. Well, mm -hmm. the first thing we have to do is get you back doing some videos. Mm -hmm. yep. it, it's, and it's not something that I am not, I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. I like doing it. I just, I don't know exactly why. Again, this is behavior that I, why, I don't know. Mm -hmm. it just, I haven't done it. So I have to change that behavior and do a few videos and realize, oh, I feel good when I do this. Giving so, more emotions. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Tie emotions exactly. to that, and then now we hope that we can be the source of emotion. Our audience, at a, you know, a request be a, a, a source of emotion for you, John, to you know, to do more videos on that. All right. I will do. I will do that, and I'll let you know when they're 
up and post it. Sure. Thank you very much. Tag us, and then we'll be able to tag and uh, you know, uh, you know, share it around our communities also. Okay. Excellent. John. Excellent. So the border sure has been open. I'm sorry. Make sure you do something today to make your father smile. Uh, tickling. Tickling. <laughs> We're tickling him. <laughs> way. The fastest and the most effective way to get him smile. So. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. We will do something tomorrow nice and kind to him. So that, uh, and I will keep doing it for 20 years. So we will become a nice and kind person, like you said. <laughs> well, you can be that tomorrow. Mm. And as we keep practicing good behavior, we slide back less often. Mm. You know, and we just keep the idea is what have I done today to get out of myself and to help someone else? Yep. And to be grateful for the fact that I'm here to do that. Mm. You do that, it'll keep moving forward. You get better and better and better. Okay. <laughs> thank you, John. You have a beautiful thank day you. there. And I thank you again for spending your time, sharing your story with us. And uh, we wish you and your family all oh, the yes. best. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Bye bye. Bye bye.